those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Patrick McGrain. Um, informally, I'm Doc. Um, I'm a, an assistant professor of criminal justice here at Glenn. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our panel this evening um, on the Confederate flag and the Confederacy itself. Our first presenter tonight is going to be uh, Dr. Judith Giesberg. Uh, Judy is a professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of History at Villanova. Judy is the author of four books on the Civil War, including, I want to make sure I've got this right, Civil War Sisterhood, the United States Sanitary Commission and Women's Politics in Transition, Army at Home, Women and the Civil War on the Northern Home Front, Keystone State in Crisis, Pennsylvania and the Civil War, and Emily Davis's Civil War, The Diaries of a Free Black Woman in Philadelphia, 1863 to 65. Is that right, did I get it all? That's it, yeah. Fuck. Awesome. All right, so uh, so that is Judy. And so what we're going to do is Judy's going to speak first for us. Um, she has very cool slides that you can't see. Uh, I could draw them. You all know how poor of a drawer I am. I'm not an, or an artist. So um, I'm going to introduce Judy. Uh, let her have it for 15 minutes. What we'll do is um, she's going to go. We'll have Becky go, then I'll go, and then we'll save time for questions at the end. So without further ado, Sounds Judy. Great. Thanks. slides is that I actually have to really use my notes because my slides will cue me. And you know how your professors use the slides to, to kind of keep track of where they're going, so I'm going to use my notes and that's why I'm standing at the podium. Uh, so thanks for coming and, um, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I um, teach the Civil War class at Villanova, so this is a topic that uh, we do talk about, but, um, but this invitation uh, within the context of recent events uh, over the summer made me um, very interested to go back and sort of revisit my notes on the topic and put together a little talk for you today that I hope will elicit uh, some conversation um, in, uh, afterward. So July 10th uh, this summer, as you all know, the battle flag, uh, the Confederate battle flag, uh, was removed from the grounds of uh, the state capitol uh, in South Carolina. And this, of course, had flown there since 1962. And as you all know, too, that the, the um, flag was finally brought down after a grassroots effort, really, uh, to, to bring it down that followed the brutal murder of nine members of the AME Emanuel Church uh, in, in Charleston. Uh, the decision to lower the flag um, it has um, elicited or has begun a national debate uh, about this uh, emblem, and that's surely why we're here today. Um, and it's of course been fueled by, um, the, the removal of the flag was fueled by those uh, videos that were released um, of Dylan Roof, uh, the purported um, shooter, um, who was posing with the flag and trying to use the flag to initiate uh, a race war. Um, events in South Carolina led to discussions throughout the country um, not only about the flag, but all sorts of Confederate iconography. Uh, are, it now, once again, seems to be up for conversation, up for uh, discussion. Um, names of streets, buildings, monuments, all of these things, we're suddenly talking about them then, again. Um, and that, I think, can be productive. And I hope we'll talk about those things today as well. Um, July 7th, just three days after South Carolina, um, uh, no, three days before South Carolina acted, uh, the National Park Service, uh, Congress voted to ban um, the Confederate flag on all, on all federal parks and cemeteries, which was a huge, huge decision on the part of the, of, of, uh, of the government. And of course, as you know, Walmart uh, stopped selling the flag, Amazon uh, followed suit, eBay, Sears, um, and, and, and all of these things seem to be ha happening in sort of breakneck speed. Um, the events, it bears to remember, um, uh, elicited counter protests, and we've heard perhaps a little bit less about those, and I wanted to mention a couple of those, a couple of examples of those, that counter protest, which has um, resulted from this sort of rapid withdrawal of flags and, and Confederate iconography. Um, and some of the images I was going to show you were some of these recent counter protests. Students returned to high school in the fall carrying Confederate flags with them. And the high schools in different parts of the country have become sort of uh, points of, of contention about whether or not students have the right to carry these uh, 
um, flags or to wear emblem wear um, flags on their body. In September 23rd, for instance, students at a Virginia high school uh, were suspended for wearing Confederate flags to school in violation of a school policy that prohibits insignia. And by the way, school po there's many, many, many uh, schools have very strong policies against wearing the insignia on campus. Um, in Michigan, students there uh, were um, uh, reminded, had to be reminded, that, that their school also had a strong policy prohibiting the emblem from school grounds when a, a bunch of students returned to high school again in September uh, wearing the flag on their clothes or um, having it attached to their cars and trucks. Um, and then there are all these other questions that people who teach this period um, and the aftermath have been asking for years. And maybe now um, we'll be able to have um, a, a bigger conversation about them. Let me just mention a couple of those to you. One uh, that has always struck me as um, something to be concerned about is that the Confederate government, excuse me, the United States government spends a huge amount of money every year uh, keeping up Confederate graves and purchasing um, headstones for the graves of Confederate soldiers. Um, this falls under the aegis of uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs, um, and by one scholar's estimate, the uh, Veteran Affairs has spent something like $2 million um, over the last decade uh, shipping um, headstones only to the Confederate dead. Um, that, that estimate is, it, 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 they've estimated that that's how much we've spent just to keep making headstones for Confederate soldiers' graves. Um, and most of those are concentrated in states like Georgia and South Carolina. Since at least 2002, the government has provided more of these headstones for Confederate graves than they have for Union soldiers' graves. And I would also add um, uh, another addendum to that, that throughout the um, uh, former Union states, or the United States, um, uh, there are graves, there are um, cemeteries for United States colored troops that are abandoned, um, and they have no markers. Uh, no fences, no indication at all that um, buried there were uh, men of color who fought for the United States government during the Civil War. Um, the Department of Veteran Affairs has probably supply, uh, uh, supplied about 33,000 of these headstones for veterans of the Civil War, total 33,000, and about more than half of those, probably 60, 70 percent of those, um, adorn Confederate. Um, um, graves. Of course, you know the Department of Veteran Affairs is the same um, uh, department that has come under fire because it neglects veterans, living veterans, um, and their medical needs, um, medical needs and, and uh, help that they really need to overcome their injuries from more recent wars. So that's one example of another conversation that, uh, that has now hopefully gotten a bigger audience and, and that I want to hear your thoughts about too afterward. The second one is military bases. Um, at least 10 US Army bases are named after Confederate generals. And you probably know about those. You've probably been to those. You've seen those. Um, all of these military bases um, in the United States that are named after Confederate generals were named after Confederate generals in the 20th century. So these are not sort of holdovers from a previous time. They were actually given these names in the 20th century. And they include Fort Lee in Virginia, named after, of course, Robert E. Lee, um, the man Ken Burns uh, once described in his epic Civil War um, documentary as a man who killed more army soldiers than Hitler. Fort Hood in Texas, named after John Bell Hood. Um, one of those Confederate, a Confederate general who lost his arm in one battle and his leg in the other battle, in another battle. Um, some of the Confederate generals after whom these military bases are named are not good. They were not good for the Confederacy either. Uh, Braxton Bragg, Fort Bragg in North Carolina is named after him, uh, was supposedly just impossible to work with. Probably would have been fired had he not been a friend of President Jefferson Davis. Um, Fort Polk in Louisiana, named after um, a slave owner um, and whose uh, military career was 
uh, mercifully ended when he was killed by a cannonball. He was a terrible Confederate general. Um, Fort Pickett in Virginia, named after who do we think? Any volunteers out there? Seen the movie Gettysburg? Um, been to the battlefield of Gettysburg? Pickett's charge, George Pickett, who led the um, uh, failed um, attack on the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, he was also accused, Pickett, after whom, again, um, a military base is made, was accused of war crimes because he, he, because he um, ordered the execution of some 22 Union prisoners. So the question is before us, right, is, is whether or not these should also be renamed. Should these army bases be renamed? These were men who fought against their government. Right? By the definitions of the time and by the definitions of today, they were traitors. Yet we have 10 military bases named after them. And that's a question that um, scholars have been asking for years, but nobody's really um, uh, listened to them. Hopefully, maybe now we're at a point where we might be able to talk about that. Now, these conversations, when they come up, are emotional. Um, and, um, and they remind us, when people's emotions get uh, riled, that these um, interpretations of the Civil War and much of our, our history are, are still up for grabs. We don't, we, have, we don't have a consensus uh, that we think we might have about what the war meant and what its legacies meant. Um, and, and, um, and, and that's really at the, at the heart of questions about the flag as well. People who study the period, people who research the period, people who write about the period, long ago decided that the most important thing that came out of the United States Civil War was the end of slavery and the beginning of civil rights. Okay. No scholar um, who studies the period, who thinks about the period, will tell you anything different. That has long ago been the case. It hasn't, there has not been a counter-argument made, a serious counter-argument made for years and years and years and years. Beyond scholars who study the period, however, um, there is a difference. There are differences of opinion about what the impo most important legacy um, of the Civil War was. And, and there still is um, a difference of opinion about civil rights in this country. And the, the use of the Confederate flag should remind us of that. So, um, so how do we engage this debate um, uh, intelligently? How do we go into it knowing something about the history of, uh, of this thing that we call the Confederate flag? Um, is what I want to talk a little bit about today in the time that I have uh, uh, remaining. And I want to start by just telling you that, 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 there, were, um, that there are multiple flags. Um, uh, there is one cause with which they're all associated with. The flag that we think of has had layers and layers and layers of meaning. And if I could show you, I could show you the different <laughs> pictures of the flag. But I'll just describe them in rich detail. Um, all right, so the first thing we, should, we need to know about this so we can be smart about this and we can talk to people uh, who, 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 who um, come to us and ask questions about what we think or people who are using the flag um, it is to know that, that there were uh, multiple flags of the Confederacy. There's not one flag that the Confederacy called its own uh, throughout its uh, uh, brief time in existence. The first flag used by the Confederacy, as you can see by the image, <laughs> um, actually looked a lot like the United States flag. Um, it was actually called the Stars and Bars um, because it had red and white horizontal stripes. It had a field of blue with white stars in it. Sound familiar? Um, that was actually the first Confederate, uh, uh, first sort of national flag of the Confederacy. It looked, it, it purposely mimicked the United States flag. Um, and in fact, it was so close to the United States flag that it created some confusion at the first battle of Bull Run in July of 1861. People didn't know whose side they were fighting against, uh, who they were fighting against because the flags looked so similar. Um, and, and so that, that flag would, would, would go undergo several different uh, metamorphoses until we get um, uh, to where we are um, with what we think in our mind about what the flag looks like. In fact, to, to make things worse at the very beginning of the Civil War, every regiment had its own flag, right? So you had, what, you had two flags that looked pretty much the same, and they were sort of the national flags, 
And then every single regiment had their own flag. So you can, you can understand why casualties were so high at the very beginning of the war. Um, uh, and, and in moments of confusion like that, it makes a lot of sense that, that, um, uh, that people thought these things actually made things worse better, rather than, uh, than better. Than better. So in 1861, that flag looked very much like the United States flag. By the following year, um, uh, this you know, sort of upstart nation had survived a year. Um, and in the aftermath of that, leaders of the Confederacy decided that they wanted to wean themselves of any images that might too closely associate them uh, with the United States. Um, and it's in that second year um, that um, they began to adopt some of the iconography that we think of today as the Confederate flag. By the second year of the war, for those of you who've taken Professor Huss's Civil War class, or are going to take it now because I've inspired you to take it, um, Robert E. Lee had come to be um, uh, a Confederate hero. Right? He, he didn't begin that way. Uh, but by the second year of the war, um, people thought he was, the, he was sort of the Civil War's first rock star. And even among people in the Union, they felt that as well. People dreamed about him and, and wanted a Robert E. Lee to fight for the Union. So he, 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 he uh, um, because of his success on the battlefield, had gotten some of that reputation that associate, associated with him. And his army of Northern Virginia, his army, had a square flag right, that had an X in the middle of it, right, uh, with stars along the X's. Um, and that flag um, was, again, the, the battle flag of, of the Army of Northern Virginia, but it was a square flag. In response to his growing popularity, the Confederate government in the, its second year of existence adopted that square cross on a flag that was for the, re uh, uh, the rest of it was all white. So they had a flag, a rectangular flag, with a square section of it that looked, that adopted Lee's um, uh, Army of Northern Virginia's flag. And that flag uh, became, they referred to it as the stainless banner, because the white had to do with their own sort of aspirations for creating this sort of perfect state. Um, it probably also had something to do with the fact that that perfect state was going to be a state based on white supremacy. Um, that flag uh, lasted for a few months, but the problem with that flag was that it was all white, right? And that when it uh, was limp, right, when it wasn't flying bravely in the wind, that all white flag looked like what? Surrender. Surrender. So somebody said, wait a minute, right? We don't want anybody to get the wrong idea about this flag. We're not always surrendering. So they added a red line along um, uh, the perimeter on the right-hand side. Um, so that people wouldn't get confused about the flag. And that red, uh, red flag, um, uh, that red bar at the end of the, the uh, flag was added um, toward the end of the war, sometime around March of 65. So there weren't a lot of those flags made, uh, that little, uh, with a little red bar. Now one of several banners flown by uh, the Confederate Navy um, was that cross, again, uh, blue cross with those uh, uh, white stars, right, the one that we think of as a Confederate flag, the Confederate Navy flew a version of that that was rectangular. Right? Um, now at the, at, at the end of the, the, the war then, remember, keep in mind, the, the, battle, the, the, the national flag of the Confederacy was this white banner with, with a red stripe down the right-hand side with that cross in the upper left-hand side. Um, and, and, and then there were these other competing flags, one that had the rectangular um, design. It's that rectangular design that was used in the Confederate Navy, which is the one that we see today, right, flying in, in uh, protests um, and flying on, on, on top of it up until July, flying on top of the Capitol in Charleston, South Carolina. It's that flag, too, that some of you have seen, probably not anybody who's as young as you guys are, but maybe some of the faculty here remember the show Dukes of Hazard. Uh, there were more Confederate flags on that, that um, television program than, than you could um, shake your finger at. Uh, and it's that flag that today we think of as the Confederate flag. So the first thing you need to do when you go into a conversation about this flag is be armed with information about the fact that there were multiple flags and there was no consensus about which one represented the Confederacy. 
So the war is over in 65, right? Excellent. The good guys win. That flag should go away, right? Just as, 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 as we sort of think about veterans um, you know, putting down their arms and marching off into the distance, we think that they should be bringing their uh, flags along with them. Well, it didn't end up that neatly, and in fact, a lot of historians today think about the end of the war as being a lot messier than we think. Instead of coming to an end in April of 1865 with Appomattox, in fact, sporadic fighting continued for months afterward. And in fact, there, were, there wasn't one surrender, there were multiple surrenders. And, right, um, uh, of course, once the Congress began to legislate civil rights, that sporadic fighting sometimes became even um, more serious. So the end of the war gets messier. Um, those armed men don't sort of march off into the sunset, and neither um, does their flag, or does the flag that we today retrospectively consider to be their one flag. Since the end of the war, the flag uh, continued, um, uh, uh, the different flags continued to belong to soldiers, um, uh, but they began to acquire new layers of meaning. The flag was associated, um, different flags, but certainly the stainless banner and that Navy Jack, the, the, uh, the one that we think of as a Confederate flag, were used in Confederate Memorial Day. That's the day when people went to honor the dead and put flags on uh, their graves. Um, all versions of these flags, the flags stayed, remained available um, into the 20th century. In the early 20th century, an or a couple of different veterans organizations uh, weighed in on which flag was the right flag and how do you properly use the flag. In 1904, uh, the, uh, the large Confederate or, uh, veterans organization called the Union of Confederate Veterans uh, named the square flag, right, not the rectangular flag, the Confederate battle flag. So this is in the early 20th century. They named it their, that, that's their flag. Uh, effectively trying to write all the other ones out of existence. Soon thereafter, uh, th this veterans organization was uh, joined with, or uh, was joined by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, um, also trying to correct the record and saying it's really not the rectangular flag you guys think it is, it's the square flag. But by the turn of the century, um, those efforts were frustrated because more and more people looked to that rectangular Navy Jack as the actual Confederate flag. Now more important than the, the shape of the flag, was the meanings that the flag would acquire over the years after the war was over. From the end of the war, really until the mid 20th century, um, uh, that uh, flag was still, again, used largely for commemorative purposes. Um, and these two organizations, this veterans organization and the United Daughters of the Confederacy, tried to control its meaning. They wanted that flag to continue to be solely used to, to adorn the, the graves of con the Confederate dead. But this all began to change um, in the 20th century for two reasons, or in two places, and that's what I'll talk for you just a couple of minutes more about. The two places where the meaning of the flag began to change beyond that decorating of graves were uh, first, college football, and second, the United States Army, or the Armed Forces, I should say. In both of those settings, uh, that Confederate battle flag, that the Confederate flag, uh, began to have new meanings. Most strongly, or most evidently, first in college football. College campuses, as you all know, you come to one every day, you spend most of your time at one, um, are really important places for cultural change. A lot of things that happen and that change about societies begin on college campuses. And this is very much the case with the Confederate flag. Now, we don't exactly know how it starts to be used on college campuses, but it's likely that it began um, in the aftermath of the war um, uh, at Washington and Lee University, where Robert E. Lee uh, was the president. A fraternity there um, at, called the Kappa Alpha uh, uh, Fraternity began to use the flag for, uh, for memorialization purposes. Chapters of this fraternity spread throughout the country and brought with them the flag. 
Now that's likely the explanation for some of its earliest uses on college campuses. And then of course during World War II, um, southern soldiers, uh, when they appeared on, uh, in, in, um, in images and photographs, of, they often posed with the Confederate flag. Right? For the first time really after World War II or at the end of World War II. Um, in, in fact, the, uh, a regiment that defeated the last Japanese soldiers at o o Okinawa, there's a really great picture that you could see, of those soldiers holding a Confederate flag. Um, and it was really an expression of their regional identity. But let's get back to football, because that's, um, in some ways, even more interesting. So football um, really began, and its early, people's early interest in it came, uh, emerged from the Ivy League schools in New England. And it was very strongly associated with the Ivy League schools in New England, really at the beginning of the 20th century. Right? If you were a southern team, uh, people didn't really care, and you usually lost. Um, uh, but uh, civic boosters by the 20s and 30s really wanted to hope to wanted to try to change that, um, and increasingly um, they did so, or they, they were able to do so uh, with by using the flag. Southern football teams, as I suggested to you, were always crummy. Uh, they always lost to these teams in New England. Um, um, uh, one of the first Southern um, college football teams to use the flag was the University of Mississippi. They adopted the flag in 1948. Um, at the same time, they also started calling themselves Ole Miss, which I'm sure you've heard. Um, and, and that's really uh, a reference to slave dialect. Uh, the reference, um, slaves would call their mistress Ole Miss. Um, so they adopted this sort of Old South image in the mid 20th century started using this uh, battle flag um, and, 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 and sort of renamed um, themselves after um, you know, this, the, the, this sort of romanticized period of slavery. So University, so University of Mississippi begins to use the flag, uh, but the flag also appears a lot of different sporting events by a lot of different southern schools. Uh, so University of Virginia uses the flag, University of North Carolina, um, uh, and, and, it go, the, and there are many other examples of that. In fact, University of Virginia uh, fans brought the flag with them when they played the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia um, in 1947, uh, which seems like um, a, a, an ill-advised plan. In fact, a lot of um, alumni from the University of Virginia who lived in the Philadelphia area uh, pleaded with students not to bring the flag with them, but they brought the flag. Uh, in any case.